Hello everyone and welcome back to this video. Today we are diving into part 2 of the crucial investment banking interview questions. So this session will not only prepare you for the investment banking interviews but also enhance your financial skills. So let's dive right in and make the most out of this valuable learning opportunity. Let's get started. What is bottom up approach of projection? Can you explain? Friends, under the bottom up approach, we build revenue projection of a company based on demand of company's product and services from existing customer base. Also, we look at the growth in the customer base of the company and what would be price of product and services in the future. So here we start with the projection of company's revenue driver and on the basis of which we do projection of overall revenue. Now let's understand this approach in a step by step manner. Bottom up approach. Step one. Growth in demand from existing customers. In this step we do estimation of expansion in the demand of existing customers of the company. How the existing customers demand for the company's product will increase in the future. So here we are not looking at the new demand from the new customers. For example, we are doing a projection of revenue of the e-commerce company. Now in this case we can see how the revenue from the existing customers will increase based on average online spending of the existing customers. You know how it will expand in the future and we can do this estimation based on company's historical trend in terms of average revenue per customer you know how it, it has grown in the past what is the industry trend how the customers are spending online over the period of time so what's the industry trend and we can also look at other relevant factors so here the focus is on how the existing customer demand is increasing now in the step two we look at growth in the number of customers so here we do the estimation of growth in the customer base of the company how the company will add new customer in its portfolio and obviously we have to net here net of the churn rate of existing customer so few customers may leave the company so we have to calculate here net addition and to calculate this net addition we can again look at the past trend growth trend in the customer base management guidance we can look at we can look at the historical churn rate technology changes emerging competition in the market penetration level in the industry so if the industry is already penetrated okay it's already saturated then the scope of expansion of new customer would be limited step three estimation of price of product and services of the company so here we do the estimation of increase in the price of products and services maybe due to the inflation impact or maybe due to the you know change in the competition etc in the last step we will do projection of the revenue and how we can project revenue here number of customers total number of customers existing as well as new average quantity per customer okay so what average quantity of product purchased by you know per customer and we multiply this with the product price the future product price for example we have total 100 customers including you know old and new and average demand per customer is say 10 units okay now we have 1000 units as a projected unit to be sold in future maybe the next year now 1000 units multiplied by product price the unit price what we are estimating so suppose we are expecting to sell our product next year at $40. Okay. So my total revenue for the next year would be $40,000. Okay. And the breakup of this $40,000 is we have first estimated consumer base and then average quantity per consumer. And then we multiplied this with the product price. So this is called a bottom up approach where we start with the company's revenue driver and then we build total projection of the company's revenue next question how do you deal with stock based compensation expenses in calculation of free cash flows to the firm so here we need to discuss about treatment of stock based compensation in the cash flow calculation friends as we know stock based compensation expenses are non cash expenses as these expenses are incurred through issuance of stock by the company rather than giving any cash so here company is giving stock to the employees and 
the value of those stocks are recorded as a stock based compensation expenses in PL account. Now, we don't add these stock based compensation expenses in FCFF calculation. So, they are not added back. Reason being, as these expenses are non cash and still we are not adding back these expenses to the FCFF calculation. And the reason being, if we add these expenses to FCFF, free cash flows to the firm, considering these expenses are non-cash and there is no cash outflow from the company, then while calculating the ECF valuation of the company, we would also need to add additional dilution that will occur in the future due to projected stock-based compensation expenses. So friends, when we are saying, okay, in future, whatever stock-based compensation expenses we recorded to the PNL account, they will not happen because of because there is no cash expense then they will result into increase in the number of shares in the future so there would be incremental shares but we have to account for in our dcf valuation and this will be a complicated calculation estimation of future dilution based on the future stock based compensation expenses would be a complicated task so this will complicate your dcf model here okay so therefore for the sake of simplicity we treat stock based compensation expenses as a cash expenses let them deduct it from our uh, free cash flows to the firm and we don't consider additional dilution from these expenses in our number of shares because we have already adjusted impact of those expenses in our cash flow right now friends let's understand how my dcf value per share will be impacted if we do not add back stock based compensation expenses or we add back them okay so let's consider both the cases and let's do the comparative analysis case one stock based compensation expenses are not added to fcff so here we are not adding stock based compensation expenses to fcff and let them deduct it in my total fcff and in this case present value of free cash flows would be on the lower side reason being my stock based compensation expenses has been deducted from this at the same time i will not add back additional dilution in my number of shares on account of future stock based compensation expenses because i have already adjusted those expenses in my fcff so my number of shares will also be on the lower side and you can see both numbers are on the lower side numerator and denominator and they will net of the impact of each other they will counter to each other so that's why the net impact on dcf value per share would be negligible now let's understand case two where we add back stock based compensation expenses to fcff in this case my dcf value per share would be present value of free cash flows to the firm which is on the higher side reason being the moment you add back stock based compensation expenses your fcff will increase now at the same time now you have to make an adjustment to your number of shares on account of future stock based compensation expenses so your number of shares will also increase and you will see the net impact would be negligible because both numerator and denominator will increase and they will counter to each other so friends to avoid this complication in the model we prefer case one where we do not add back stock based compensation expenses to fcff and we treat them as a cash expenses question number 13 what is cost of capital wacc the answer is it's a weighted average cost of capital of the company wacc primarily includes two components cost of equity multiplied by weightage of equity plus cost of debt multiplied by weightage of debt. So equity and debt, these are the two most common type of sources of capital. In case friends, company is using any additional source of capital, say preferential capital. So we'll add that also in this equation. The cost of equity, cost of equity is an expected return by the equity shareholders. So what return they are expecting from the company is your cost of equity. And how do we measure this cost of equity? We can measure this cost of equity using CAPM model, capital asset pricing model, where cost of equity is equivalent to risk-free rate. Risk-free rate is the return what you can earn without taking any risk, say government bond return, plus beta into equity risk premium, where equity risk premium represents the market premium, what additional return equity market is giving over and above risk-free rate. And we multiply this ERP market premium with the beta of the company. 
So beta basically measure riskiness of stock to the market. If the company is more riskier than the market, then obviously the premium should be more. So for example, say risk free rate in the country is say 6%. Okay. So this risk free return you can earn without taking any risk and then equity risk premium. So the market is giving total return of 15% and out of 15%, 6% we can easily earn without taking any risk. So what additional return market is giving here? 9%. Okay. So this is the market risk premium, the additional premium what market, equity market is offering. We will multiply this 9% with the beta of the company. Say beta of the company is 1.5. If the stock is 1.5 times riskier than the market, so we'll multiply this with the 9% premium. Okay. So now my additional premium from the company will be 13.5% plus we'll add 6% here. So total cost of equity would be 19.5%. Okay. Now you can see guys one additional adjustment here size premium. Now this size premium is applicable only for the small size companies where the shareholders are expecting some additional return from the company. Their expectation from the company is earning slightly more than what this CAPM equation calculate. Okay, so normally small cap companies have a tendency to outperform the minimum required return and this tendency is captured through size premium. But this premium is not added in case you are doing this calculation for the large cap companies. Cost of debt. So cost of debt of the companies, let me clean this first. So cost of debt of the company is, it's the current cost of debt of the company. What cost company is supposed to pay on its new debt? We can calculate this cost of debt with the various method, but the most popular method is spread based cost of debt. So how we can calculate cost of debt under this method? Again, we'll start with the risk free rate. So what the cost, what government is paying, okay, without giving any risk to the investors, but as the company is not as safe as the government, right? So company is supposed to pay some defaults, some additional return on its debt. So we measure this additional return with the corporate default spread. So this corporate default spread represents what additional interest you are supposed to pay on your bond compared to the government bond. And we can measure this on the basis of credit rating of the company. Okay. So if the company has inferior rating, the spread would be higher. If the company has better rating, the spread would be less. So friends, this is how we can calculate component of cost of capital cost of debt and cost of equity and finally we will multiply these cost with the weightage of equity and weightage of debt which is nothing but the total equity divided by total capital in equity plus debt and in case of debt it's debt divided by debt plus equity. Now let's move to the next question. What is size premium? So the size premium is the premium demanded by the equity investor for investing in the small size companies. As we discussed in the previous question, size premium, what investors are expecting, what additional return investors are expecting from the small size company is captured through size premium. It represents the excess return expected by the shareholder of small size companies over and above the minimum required return calculated as per CAPM model. So CAPM model calculates a justified return as per the risk in the company. But as, the, as we discussed, the small size companies have a tendency to outperform the minimum required return, right? So this tendency is represented by size premium. Size premium is equal to expected return by the shareholders minus minimum return as per standard CAPM model. Okay. Next question is, what is levered and unlevered beta? Friends, levered beta is what? The levered beta is the total risk. It measures the total risk associated with the equity investment in the business. Okay. So when you put your money into equity of the company, you are taking some risk. This is measured through levered beta. And this beta includes two types of risk. One is the business risk and another risk is the leverage risk. So when you put your money in the business, one risk associated with the equity is business risk, the kind of business the company is operating into. So if the company is operating into risky business, your beta would be high. The another risk what you are taking when you're putting your money into equity is the leverage risk. If the company has more debt in its capital structure, your beta will increase, your risk in the business will 
increase it will magnify okay so both these risks together will give you a lever beta the total risk of the business so as we discussed the business risk is the risk associated with the operations of the company the kind of business the company is into and the leverage risk is what this is the risk associated with having debt in the capital structure of the company more the debt more the leverage risk unlevered beta so unlevered beta is what unlevered beta represents only and only business risk it represents only the business risk of the company formula for unlevered beta is levered beta multiplied by the equity factor okay and divided by equity plus debt net of tax impact okay this equation this equation will give you business risk of the company unlevered beta of the company question 16 what is liquidity discount friends this discount this liquidity discount is applicable for less liquid stocks in the market stocks which are not readily sellable in the market we normally apply this discount for the valuation of a private company reason being as in case of private companies we don't have any readily available market to sell stock of the company right so if you are an investor investing your money in the private company you are taking one additional risk there is no ready market available for selling your stock in you know in case you want to exit but in case of liquid stock in case of listed company stock you can easily sell your st stake in the market whenever you want so when you're doing valuation of private company we consider this risk this risk in the valuation we apply some discount on the final value to capture this risk for the investor question number 17 different methods of calculation of tv terminal value so what are the different different methods of calculation of terminal value friends there are two methods to calculate terminal value one method number one perpetual growth method under this method, we need to assume a perpetual growth rate that business can sustain indefinitely after its high growth phase. So in this method, once the high growth phase of the company is over, we have to assume a growth rate, what business can sustain forever for the infinite period after the high growth phase. In the friend, the formula for calculation of terminal value under this method is cf1 cf1 is what immediate next year cash flow so suppose you are ending your projection in year 5 this would be cash flow for year 6 divided by r r is your discount rate minus g g is your long term growth rate right the growth rate what business will sustain forever and this terminal value this equation will give you a value of all the future cash flows present value of all the future cash flows from the next year till infinity so say if your projection is ending in year 5 this will give you value of cash flow from year 6 to infinity right so this is so powerful equation now in this as we have already discussed cf1 is the next year cash flows r is the discount rate applicable for the company and g is the constant growth rate method number two exit multiple approach under this approach we calculate terminal value using a relative approach Friends, under this method, we calculate value of the company, value of the business at the end of the projection period by applying a relative multiple on its final year EBITDA. So, terminal value is equal to terminal year EBITDA, last year EBITDA, when you are ending your projection, multiplied by EBITDA multiple, EV to EBITDA multiple, which you will source from your trading comps. So this will give you value of the business at the end of the projection period, which is your terminal value. Friends, this multiple you can source from trading comps or transaction comps as we have already discussed. Which method of terminal value is better to use? Friends, both the methods we have discussed above have their own pros and cons. Okay, exit multiple and perpetual growth method. So let's first discuss perpetual growth method. What are the pros and cons of perpetual growth method? Pros benefit of using perpetual growth method friends perpetual growth method is technically more sound approach for calculation of terminal value in dcf dcf approach see the reason being under perpetual growth method the basis of calculation of terminal value is cash flow 
we are assuming that the cash flow will grow at a constant rate forever so on this basis on the basis of this assumption we are calculating present value of all the future cash flows growing at a constant pace at the end of projection period so in this approach my terminal value is using intrinsic approach to value a terminal value of the company right so this is more fundamental value of the company than the another method exit multiple which we'll discuss cons friends one of the major limitation of this method is estimation of long term growth rate what business can sustain forever so friends here you need to estimate growth rate what business can sustain after its projection period and which is very difficult assumption to take here you have to estimate growth rate for the infinite period and impact of this growth rate assumption is substantial in your terminal value so under this method your terminal value which is contributing major part of your total dca value is very subjective right so it makes your dca valuation very subjective subjective to the long term growth rate assumption which itself is very subjective assumption exit multiple method so under this method terminal value is calculated using relative approach so here we apply a bidda multiple on the last projected year bidda to calculate value of the business at the end of projection period pros what are the benefit of this method in this method we need not to estimate long term growth rate what business can sustain indefinitely so friends here we don't need to estimate long term growth rate which is very subjective assumption to calculate my terminal value okay instead of this here we need to estimate exit multiple the multiple what company can get at the time of exit one when you are ending your projection and we can easily source this multiple from the trading comps okay so it's not very subjective multiple assumption basically we can easily source we can see how the uh, peer group companies are trading in the market and based on this we can find the industry multiple so under this method my dcf valuation is less subjective compared to perpetual growth method what we discussed above cons limitation of this method one of the major limitation of this method is it transforms your dcf valuation into more of a relative valuation reason being guys as the terminal value contributes major part of your total dcf value almost 60 to 70% and this terminal value under this method is calculated using relative approach so your dcf valuation is dominated by relative approach than the intrinsic approach under this method okay so we can say technically first method is more sound because it is more in sync with dcf valuation but uh, logically the second method is more sound because here you are not supposed to take any assumption about long term growth rate what company can sustain indefinitely question number 19 how do you decide long term growth rate of a business in dcf valuation so here we need to provide base basis of selection of long term growth rate what we discussed in the previous question in the perpetual growth method right so as we discussed long term growth rate is very subjective assumption in dcf right so we have to estimate growth rate what business can sustain for indefinite period therefore we assume this growth rate to be around gdp growth rate of the country so we don't go very aggressive on this growth rate we assume that in the long term the company will grow close to the gdp growth rate of the country this assumption is based on understanding that while a business may experience a high growth rate in the short term they may grow higher than the gdp growth rate of the country but in long term the growth rate will eventually converge to the gdp growth rate of the country so when making the long term growth rate assumption it is important to consider the growth rate that country is expected to achieve and sustain over the long term so maybe the currently country is having a growth rate of 8 9% but in the long term if the this growth rate is going to go down and the country is expected to sustain a growth rate of say 5 6% so we should not assume 8 9% as a long term growth rate because in the long term country itself you know will not be able to sustain this growth rate so here we should consider long term estimated growth rate of the country rather than a short term growth rate friends we hope this video has been helpful to you we will be releasing part 3 soon until then stay tuned and stay informed goodbye